you can't understand this because you're not ocularly challenged. But owning glasses is a lot like being Lady Macbeth. No matter how much you scrub, they just never come clean. <laughs> the blood's always there. It's always there. The blood's always there. <laughs> Out damn spot. What a Welcome to another episode of In Defense Of, the internet series dedicated to hunting down the bastards abusing the advertising budgets of the movies, TVs, and books that I cherish and others didn't want to fund. I'm your rude, crude, and tattooed agent for hire, Jared Walter, here to lecture at the University of Amazon Publishing on Max Berry's book, Jennifer Government. This is one of my favorite books, and Max Berry is a hidden treasure of a writer. Jennifer Government was published in 2003 and takes place in an alternate current reality where most countries dissolve their governments as we know them and replace their rule of law with a U.S.-led trade bloc coalition of countries. Now, without context, this sentence doesn't make any sense. Uh, can you show them the map, please? So, democracy is replaced with this sort of unleashed capitalism that covers all the blue places. Uh, in the book, it's explained that once America changes over to this new rule of law, it is almost immediately accepted in most white countries. We'll get more into the details and specifics of the world building later in the secondary nary section. But for now, let's just introduce the book, some backstory, some main characters, and explain their names. Firstly and foremostly, 2003 was a fairly competitive year in publishing. There was Harry Potter and the adults who are obsessed with him, highlights for adults, the How Physics Works, Doc Brown's Old Westerny Wife, Lucifer thinks you're poor, a whole bunch of lies connected to Oprah, again, and, uh-oh, our kid's gonna shoot people. When Jennifer Government was released, it didn't make much of a splash, despite being relatively well-received critically. Barry's piece was said to have gotten everything right, was fast-paced and exciting, fresh and cool, wonderfully dark, and extremely funny. Obviously, I agree, hence the whole video we're doing here. Unfortunately, whether it was the heavy-handed title or the flood of lesser New York Times bestsellers, Jennifer Government was pulled under the current of popular appeal and missed. That said, in 2003, Section 8, the production company of Steven Soderbergh and George Clooney, optioned it. When Section 8 filed for Chapter 7 in 2006, the film rights went back to Max Berry, where they remain to this day. As we go through, let's do some fantasy casting, shall we? The book itself is a relentless onslaught of plot, detail, character, and tone. Much like all of Max Berry's works, the reader isn't offered any solid ground to stand on until a couple of chapters in. Berry hits the ground running, introducing you to Jennifer Government, Hack Nike, John Nike, Violet Enterprises, and the rest while layering his story with detail and context. So, somewhere around page 30 to 50, one finally has enough pieces of the puzzle to recognize that there is a picture. It's challenging while still being accessible and smart, while still being very fast-paced and action-packed. Fun fact, Max Berry cut over a thousand pages from this book, which only clocks in at around 800 pages. In a story that is as densely layered and action-packed as this is, to consider he cut more than what was published shows an effort of precise surgery that removes all ego and selfishness. With that said, let's go to the details in secondarily. To reiterate, Jennifer Government takes place in an alternate reality, not quite a near future, where most of the world has joined a U.S.-led capitalist coalition, anarcho-capitalism as it's called in the book. In this case, the government cannot write laws, they can only enforce the code of law decided upon by the new constitution. In this case, the government works to prevent crime and will only investigate crime if someone pays for the agent's time. Jennifer also has a daughter named Kate Mattel Government because she goes to the school owned and operated by the Mattel Toy Company. <laughs> there are other major organizations that used to be taxpayer funded, like the police, that are now strictly for hire. You know, like Pinkerton's. The motivating action of the story is Nike's release of a new line of sneakers and their VP of Gorilla Marketing, John Nike, launches a hideous plan to do so. John Nike hires Hack Nike, a dunce of an adult, to gun down teenagers crowding a store rumored to get a, a shipment of the coveted Nike Mercuries. Now can we get a graph going here? This gets a little confusing quickly. <clears throat> Thank you. So. 
Because Hack Nike ignorantly signs a contract to murder people, he turns to the police to subcontract the hit. Based on the cut they will get by subcontracting the killings, they aim to do a great job. So they end up gunning down a bunch of kids at a bunch of stores. Fortunately for us, this is a farce and in an alternate universe where police would never gun down teenagers, no matter how much their phones look like guns. Concurrently, while Hack is subcontracting, a dude by the name of Bai Mitsu makes a bunch of money after wisely maneuvering stocks. Exuberant with his newfound wealth, he gives money to a young girl who ends up being one of the kids that gets gunned down by the police. Feeling responsible, Bai teams up with Jennifer, who appoints herself to the case, despite not having any funding other than what Bai can afford to fund her with. As she, suspe as she suspects, John Nike is behind the killings. And you see, Jennifer used to have this barcode tattoo from when she was a marketing executive with Mattel, because you just a barcode eye. This is the barcode for Malibu Barbie, her then husband's nickname for her. And that husband is none other than John Nike, of course. Knowing him intimately, she suspects he is behind the killings and wants to employ vengeance for the purpose of justice. Are you casting this role in your head in the home game yet? There are some other side plots involving Hack Nike's girlfriend, the self-employed hacker called Violet Enterprises, who creates an unstoppable computer virus that helps facilitate hostile corporate takeovers. You see, in this world, hostile corporate takeovers include missiles and tanks and computer viruses. There is also a war brewing between two credit card companies called U.S. Alliance and Team Advantage. In this world, these cards work as loyalty programs within a credit card, and every business that accepts payments from customers has picked one card or the other. Additionally, after being released by Jennifer Government, Hack Nike starts an anti-corporate activist group that actually goes as far as they need to. Occupy Wall Street was a failure because they didn't have the balls that this moronic coward grows. That's our cast of characters. Let's finish the recap. So, as Jennifer and Bai hunt John, John works with U.S. Alliance team members such as Pepsi, McDonald's, and Microsoft, and most importantly, the NRA, who is basically a four-hire army, tanks and all. Violet gets screwed over by ExxonMobil, so she joins forces with John Nike, who makes her kidnap Jennifer's daughter in an attempt to scare her back off the crusade. ExxonMobil, again, who backstab Violet, is with Team Advantage, the group that includes Coke, Burger King, Apple, and the police, which is also an army! Oh, look, another graphic! <laughs> oh, these are the best. <laughs> so, because you're smart, you can see and extrapolate how all these companies line up and how dominance for the market share through warfare will shake out. In the finale of the book, the war breaks out and consumers themselves confront each other and go so far as to burn down some of the rival businesses and their respective loyalty programs. Jennifer gets her daughter back from Violet with the help of Hack and Buy. Violet and John see justice for their greed and evil. <laughs> Just kidding. They get slaps on the wrist and will totally be able to coordinate another war within the decade. Notice how there's a bunch of primary characters doing a lot of things and a bunch of action? When you consider that each chapter is from the point of view of whichever character best serves the moment of the plot, it's easy to see that this is a super fun, fast, detailed action cop drama. Seriously, how is this not a movie? I mean, come on! Now that we got through the synopsis, let's get into what we usually do here in part numero trace. The point of Jennifer government isn't to teach us anything. It isn't to wag a finger and warn us of a financially imposing future. Max Berry admits that he himself asked, what if corporations got to have all the power and do everything? And then he just went from there. Interestingly, he did predict the 2014 corporations are people court actions. He predicted companies having political power by pulling events and productions out of areas they disagree with. He also gives us a retelling of classic warning stories, the likes of The Merchant of Venice and Brave New World. What Jennifer Government does expertly is show us how real people exist in a fully realized and fleshed out world of anno... An I said it earlier. Fully realized and fleshed out world of anarcho-capitalism. At the center of this story about capitalism run wild is a smart, powerful woman who loves her daughter more than anything and has an empty, broken heart. She's obviously more than just a mother and an ex-lover. She also has concrete moral convictions, incredible character, and strength of will. I'm almost genuinely surprised that Max Berry writes women so well, but I'm also a guy, so my opinion on that's kind of worth nothing. There are very few pro-government dystopian novels. This might actually be the only one. If you believe that cops are overfunded and that capitalism as we know it in its late stages is broken, this book is for you. 
If you believe that corporations deserve basic human rights and government oversight stifles companies' creativity, then this book is also for you. There's clear-cut critique of humanity in this book, but not a hard-handed lecture on politics. People's greed combined with unfettered power is the driving antithesis here. There are a lot of neat thought experiments and a surprising amount of foresight into current issues between gunfights and kidnappings. The role of the police is incredibly poignant. One could currently make the argument that the police force is successfully executing its role as the dominant force to keep minorities and poor people in their place. This is kind of a fair argument considering the history of policing in this nation comes from a place of slave enforcement and protecting the rich. Whatever policing has become, I do believe that most people agree that law and order, only to those who can afford it, is unjust. There is a further argument that when wealth inequality reaches a certain point, the result is always violence. Historically, that violence is expressed through the overthrowing of the current government or the fascist crushing of a populace to ensure the current imbalance of power. As wealth inequality grows in our real-world America, we're beginning to see a new example of this violence. People just shooting people. Yes, there are slow-motion violences happening in courtrooms and senate halls to ensure the rich stay rich, but actual blood in the streets violence is happening every day, it just seems a lot more senseless. As wealth inequality gets to a breaking point in his version of reality, people back their own oppressors and fight for them, hoping that extra loyalty points will help them pay rent and buy food. Barry successfully anticipates that without a central government to oppress people or be overthrown, then people's anger and frustration with their lot in life will just be unleashed on whatever instantly gratifying target comes to mind. If there is food insecurity and housing insecurity, let alone the inability to afford basic utilities, that creates a strain on the psyche. If we can't feel safe and secure, then people tend to commit more violence. Last little tangent here. Taxes support the things that help us feel safe and secure. Taxes support people's ability to acquire wealth and retire. If you take the social structure that creates a safety net away, we are leaving the populace at the mercy of the wealth holders. If we take a glance towards Jeff Bobos in Paradise, Nark Funkerberg, Tim Apple, and Elon, why won't people just say I'm smart and prettier than Nikola Tesla? <laughs> Musk. There's a plenty of behavior to create distrust, and these people could possibly have society in mind when they make decisions. Amazon used illegal tactics to ensure a union wouldn't start. Facebook creates algorithms that focus on garnering emotion to ensure site activity, which has led to an exponential growth of U.S.-based terrorist organizations. Laissez-faire capitalism does not protect individuals from the real-life Lex Luthers of the world. One may even argue that elected representatives should create laws to protect us and support our communities. I don't know if our government can still properly function to protect us as a people from ourselves, but I do know one government that can, and her goddamn name is Jennifer. That's enough of my opinion. Hopefully I've explored this incredible book enough for those that are familiar and convinced a few of you to give it a read. For those playing the home game, let's do some casting! These are obviously the right answers. If you came up with something else, you're wrong. Until next time, I've been Jared Walter, and this has been In Defense of Jennifer Government. If you like what you saw, please share and subscribe. I love comments, so please leave one of those. If you watched this and then read the book, let me know how you liked it. Also, make sure to check out our podcast channel, Fantasy Draft Fiction, where we play improv trivia games based on pop culture. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.